Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Michael Hampel. I'm the presenter of St Paul's, and on behalf of the chapter and the whole cathedral community, a very warm welcome to today's Sunday Forum here in the Wren Suite. Uh, we're delighted that you're here whenever uh, Professor McGrath comes. It's standing room only, so bear that in mind next time. Bring your camping stools with you. But it is lovely to see a full Wren Suite uh, with so many people uh, eager uh, to hear our speaker and to engage in debate afterwards with him. Uh, Professor McGrath is a Northern Irish theologian, priest, intellectual historian, scientist and Christian apologist. He holds the Andreas Idrios Professorship in Science and Religion in the Faculty of Theology and Religion at the University of Oxford. He has three doctorates from the University of Oxford, a DPhil in Molecular Biophysics, a Doctor of Divinity in Theology and a Doctor of Letters in Intellectual History. And doesn't it just show in the book that many of us have just read? We're often told that faith and science are at war with one another and we have somehow to choose one or the other. Professor McGrath says it's time to consider another way of looking at these two great cultural forces. What if science and faith might actually enrich each other? The book that many of us have been looking at and that Professor McGrath will talk about and from and to today is Inventing the Universe, Why We Can't Stop Talking About Science, Faith and God, published by Hodder in 2015. We're delighted and very grateful that Alistair McGrath is with us today. Uh, the pollen is very, very high at the moment and Professor McGrath has a sore throat, so we're extra grateful to him for braving that uh, and for nevertheless giving us his time uh, and his thoughts and his wisdom. Please give a very warm welcome to Alistair McGrath. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a huge pleasure to be with you today here at St Paul's. I apologise if I croak from time to time. Um, um, I think we are victim of some sort of pollen attack, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to cope with this. My topic today is something about the relation of science and faith. I have 40 minutes, so I can only sketch some themes. And what I thought I would do is pick up on some themes from the book that the presenter mentioned, which was called Inventing the Universe. It's all about how we might think about the relationship of science and faith. Let me say immediately, there is no right way of understanding the relation of science and faith. Uh, the history of this is so complex that unless you are an extremely dogmatic person, or a person who actually doesn't, doesn't like history very much, um, you, know, you cannot see a simple pattern. You can impose a pattern. I mean, for example, the so-called conflict thesis, that science and religion are universally and necessarily at war, is a classic example of what we call a golden thread argument, which means that you look at the immense complexity of history and you say, well, we'll pick out that incident and that incident and that incident, we'll tie them together and say, that's the whole thing. And in effect, it simplifies, it reduces, it distorts. Let me give you an example. A very good recent example of this is Christopher Hitchens' book, uh, God is Not Great. And this is a, what I would describe as a magisterial presentation of this very defective form of argument. Here's a little soundbite from that book. He mentions that Timothy Dwight, an American theologian of the late 18th century, opposed smallpox vaccination on religious grounds. That is true. What is not true is that that discloses a bigger pattern. In effect, you have to stand back and say, well, what other evidence is there? And anyone who knows anything about smallpox vaccination might suggest we need to bring other people into the dialogue. For example, the American theologian Jonathan Edwards, who was a vigorous advocate of smallpox vaccination in the generation before Dwight, and to prove to his students of Princeton that smallpox vaccination was safe, he had it himself and died from it five years later, five days later. So you, know, you might, might think Eddie would mention that because it does suggest that the picture is not quite as simple as he is suggesting. Or again, those of you who know more recent history will think of a, a well-known 20th century writer, which is George Bernard Shaw. And George Bernard Shaw, a very aggressive, in my view, atheist, um, also opposed smallpox vaccination, saying this was the result of people like Joseph Lister and Louis Pasteur, who were intellectual charlatans. Now, I think many of us would, would simply say, well, that is, um, that is something we don't really want to talk about very much, but 
If you're like me and belong to a certain older generation, you may remember watching Dr. Finley's casebook on BBC many years ago. And one of the episodes in that first series was Dr. Finley trying to sort out a family who had read George Bernard Shaw and weren't, that, weren't um, inoculating their children against smallpox as a result. My point is simple. You can simplify this and say, Dwight, that's the big picture, that's it. But it's not like that. There isn't a big picture. It's a complex picture of conflict of points, synergy of points, unease of points, happiness of points. It's immensely complex. And I would just urge you to be very cautious of those who simplify, because very often they do so with very obvious agendas. In this lecture, what I want to do is open up some themes. And what I'm going to say is, really I'm telling you what I think about this relationship with science and religion. Not because I want to impose these views on you, but because I want to give you food for thought. I want to try and say, here's how I think about it. Does this help you think through this in any way? And my own background is that of someone who, as a teenager back in Northern Ireland, was absolutely convinced that science and religion were um, absolutely opposed to each other. In effect, to be a scientist was necessarily to be somebody who was opposed to religious belief. And actually, in Northern Ireland of the 1960s, which is what we're talking about, that was actually quite an easy belief to hold. Uh, because at that time, it seemed to me that, that religion was creating social violence. And therefore, you know, with all the certainties of a 16-year-old, it seemed to me very, very evident. You know, no religion, no religious violence, end of problem. Um, but more, I think more importantly, I had this very strong sense that science was able to answer all of humanity's big questions, and therefore there was simply no legitimate intellectual space left for God. And that was actually, I have to say, quite a common view around that time. You still find it, but I have to say to you that, 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 that there's been a sort of sea change in recent years, and people now are seeing these kind of things in different ways. I think for me, the, the kind of major turning point in my own thinking was going to Oxford University to study chemistry in great detail. And although I arrived at Oxford as an atheist who expected my um, anti-religious faith to be confirmed by my scientific studies, actually it began to raise very, very unsettling questions. For example, the nature of proof the relationship of theory and observation, well, there's such things as critical experiments, the um, very difficult question of the underdetermination of theory by evidence, and so on. And those of you who study the philosophy of science will know all about these and don't need me to elaborate on them. What I began to realize is that actually science was much more complex than I had realized. In effect, I had a rather childish view of science, which began to crumble when confronted with serious scientific thinking at a leading British research university. And so in effect, I, I began to rethink things, moving away from atheism to Christianity, uh, and trying to then say, well, I used to think that religion was absolutely in incompatible with Christianity. How now can I begin to frame their relationship? And in many ways, the, the book I've been, been talking about, Inventing the Universe, tells you something about how I began to navigate my way towards what I hope will be seen as a reasonably habitable way of thinking. So what sort of ideas do we want to talk about? Well, let me begin by saying that we need some kind of framework to begin to think about these things. And this is actually much more difficult than you might think. Because people tend to have this view, there is this thing called science, very well defined. There's this thing called religion, very well defined. And so it's quite easy to figure out what their relationship is. But again, the historians enter the picture. And they show to us, you might think of Peter Harrison's recent book, The Territories of Science and Religion, which is a must read if you're thinking about these questions. It effectively makes the point that there is no defining definition of what science is or what religion is. That's a very important point. For example, if there's anybody in the audience who's a sociologist of religion or a psychologist of religion, you have to face up to the fact that religion is not actually empirically defined. It, in effect, is a social construction. It is what society deems to be religion. But religion itself is not an empirical notion at all. So you have this real problem about definition right from the word go.
But nevertheless, I think we can begin to do some navigating. And I think there are two models that are quite helpful. One of them is to say, maybe we can think of science and religion as offering us different perspectives on life. So let me try and flesh that out. In the book, the philosopher I kind of way use as a dialogue partner most is Mary Midgley. And many, many of you have read Mary Midgley. She's a formidable lady. She's now in the 90s. She writes very, very well, very, very clearly. And in a series of recent books, she develops the idea that, in effect, reality is so complex that we need what she calls multiple maps if we're going to make sense of it. And this means, in effect, that with something enormously complex, we have to approach it from different angles. And in order to give a full picture of a complex reality, we in fact have to say from this angle it looks like this, but from this it looks like this. And in effect, the, the reality as a whole is the summation of these individual angles of view. Maybe, she says, we can think of science as one such angle of view and religion as another. And she, she gives us lots of examples. Um, her best example is thinking of a, a very large aquarium, which is very, very hard to get your head around. And you can look through little portholes. And you see bits of it. And what you've got to realize, if you limit the aquarium to the bit you look at there, you're missing so much. You need to somehow bring these things together to weave these observational threads into a coherent overall picture. I find that quite helpful because one way of beginning to think about science and religion is that in many ways science is trying to help us understand how things work, how they function. And that I want to emphasize is an enormously important question. But religion actually is dealing with something slightly different, which is what do things mean? I'm going to come back to that later. But what I'm going to say is that these things are not actually inconsistent. They're inconsistent if somehow thinking about meaning is inconsistent with observational facts. That's certainly true, but they don't need to be. And the point I'm going to emphasize is that we need a big picture of reality, unless you're going to limit yourself to a hopelessly superficial and thin account of a complex reality. You need to find some way of being able to weave together different ideas and say these are all part of something bigger. And it's so easy to say, I look at things this way and that's it. But the challenge is to say, well, maybe that is one way of looking at things. The question is what other things need to be said. So Mary Midgley, I think, gives us one way of beginning to do this. And it is, <coughs> I think, helpful in some ways but not, I think, in others. So here is another way of thinking, which again, I find helpful, and I'm offering to you in case it may be helpful to you as well. And as I say, maybe we need to think about science and religion working at different levels, different levels. Now, what do I mean by that? Basically, it's saying that if you try to offer an explanation for something, you can give explanations at different levels, but those explanations are not necessarily contradictory. For example, um, I am raising a glass of water. Why am I raising a glass of water? Well, you can give one answer, which is basically, um, you know, there are sort of electromechanical stimuli coming down my arm, muscle contraction, there we go. That explains how I raised a glass of water. And you see, that's right. I mean, I mean that is right, but it's only part of the answer. And you know what the rest of the answer is? The rest of the answer is I've got a sore throat. So therefore, I say I need a glass of water. Or again, to give a very famous example from the discussion of this question, uh, you might like to imagine a kettle that's boiling on a gas ring. Why do I say a gas ring? Because the guy who first used this was writing back in the 1960s, and that was what he used. But anyway, there's a kettle boiling on the gas ring. Question, why is the kettle boiling? Well, answer one, because gas is being converted into energy through a process of energy conversion, which you can describe, raising the water to boiling point. That's right. But the point you also want to make is, well, the kettle's boiling because I wanted to make a cup of tea. Now, now I know it sounds trivial, but those are both right. 
Does the fact that answer one is right mean that answer two is wrong? No. Does the fact that answer two is right mean answer one is wrong? No. The key point is that you can offer a scientific explanation for something which illuminates part of it, but in effect leaves open room for further explanatory engagement. And that's the point I want to make. I mean, it's not like Richard Dawkins would say, well, you can offer scientific explanation for everything. I'm sure he's right. But it's not a total explanation. In effect, there's a lot more that needs to be said. So what more does need to be said? For me, one of the questions we need to ask is whether the natural sciences have limits. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about this in relation to what I think is a very important question, which is the, the fact that we as human beings crave for meaning. Those of you who are psychologists will be aware of the work of Crystal Park or Ken Pargament, and in effect they've done a whole series of studies to in effect show how this drive to find meaning really is important to people. And scientifically, you can, you can actually get quite a long way in, in dealing with this question. You can say, let us investigate what it is that people find meaningful and the difference that it makes to their lives. And a social psychologist like Roy Baumeister would say there are four key areas where people actively seek and reflect because these are seen as being important to their psychological well-being. The four that Roy Barmeister mentions are the following. Let's see if these make sense to you. Number one, identity. Who am I? Number two, agency. What difference can I make to this world? Number three, value. Do I really matter? Number four, purpose. Why? am I here? And the psychologists tell us, and I have no reason to dispute this, that these questions remain really important for most people. Psychologists don't actually tell us why we find these things important. They're very helpful at clarifying the fact that we do, and in effect allowing us to map that on to our reflections about life. But the key point I'm going to make is this. If, as human beings, meaning matters profoundly, what happens if science can't tell us what that meaning is? And it's, it's a real question. One of my favorite scientists is Sir Peter Medawar. He's an Oxford scientist. He died some years ago. He won the Nobel Prize for Medicine for his work on immunobiology. But towards the end of his life, he wrote a little book called The Limits of Science. A rationalist. I mean, Meadow was a rationalist. He didn't really like religion very much. But he was very, very clear. He said, look, there are certain questions that science is not merely unable to answer now, but will be unable to answer at any point. And these are things like meaning and value. And what he's trying to make is that actually if science answers those questions, it stops being science and becomes something else. Now, it's a very interesting question. Some of you will have read, for example, um, Sam Harris's book, The Moral Landscape, which, in effect, tries to give a scientific answer to this question of morality, but in effect saying you can provide a scientific answer to questions of what it is we should value. And it's a very interesting book. The difficulty is it smuggles in all kinds of metaphysical and moral presuppositions in answering the question. And in the end, I think it constructs a purely circular argument. But it's interesting because it recognizes the importance of this question. Where do our ideas of value, where do our ideas of meaning come from? And in the book, Inventing the Universe, what I try to say is, look, um, maybe we can hold science and faith together in some way. For example, by saying that they illuminate different areas of life which are important. Now, this does not settle boundary issues. For example, what happens if there's overlap or if there's some kind of dispute. But it does give us this framework for beginning to think about these things. For me, one of the great things about science is its emphasis on evidence. In other words, that you need to be able to give reasons for what it is that you believe. And therefore, if you're a scientist, you are going to want to say, 
I want explanations of why this happens. I don't just want a, a sort of reassertion it does happen. I want some sort of explanation. And the importance of evidence in this, I think, is enormously important. This has led some people to say, in effect, that you must be able to prove everything that you believe. And this, I think, is one of the habits of the movement that sprang up in 2006, 2007, which I think has, has faded away since then, sometimes called the New Atheism, which in effect seemed to say that you only accept what it is that you can prove. I hope I've misunderstood them, because that's clearly just not right. Basically, the issue that we all face, whether you are religious or non-religious or anti-religious, is that all of us end up believing things that go beyond the available evidence. And if I had to make a criticism of new atheism, I think one of the points I would make is that it uses criteria to judge others' beliefs, which it doesn't apply to itself. In other words, you know, you prove your beliefs, but mine are so self-evidently correct, I don't need to do this. I do want to raise a question about that. But there's a much more important question here. And let me make this through an intermediary. This is Sir Isaiah Berlin, who's one of Oxford's, uh, was rather, one of Oxford's most important philosophers and intellectual historians. And Berlin focused on people's ethical, political, and social ideas. Very important things to think about as we approach a general election. And Berlin made this point, and it's a very telling point, and I leave this um, suspended in the air, so to speak, for you to think about. What Berlin says is that when we look at the really big questions that give each of us purpose and direction and animation about what the nature of good is, what kind of society we're looking for, who we think we are, what we're meant to be doing, and so on, we find ourselves in this difficult situation of believing things and believing them to be important, but being unable to prove that they are true. Postmodern philosophers would simply say, well, that, that's the way it is, get used to it. You know, that is part of the epistemic dilemma we face as human beings, which is there are things that really matter to us and that we have good reason for thinking are right, but cannot actually prove that they are true. And that's just the way we are. You can prove lots of stuff in logic and mathematics, when it comes to other things, like the meaning of life, why we're here, and so on, things get rather more complex. Isaiah Berlin's point is this. Since none of us can prove the things that really matter in life, we could at least be gracious to each other and try to learn to live with each other. Now, that's a politician speaking, and I respect that judgment enormously. But I want you to note the intellectual point that lies behind it, that in effect all of us, end up holding things, precious, important, which we can't absolutely prove to be right. That does not make us irrational. If you look at, for example, the, the massive literature on, to give you, for example, um, social epistemology and things like that, you know, this is just the way the field has gone. The recognition that because we are human beings, we are trapped in a situation which means that we end up really being committed to things that can't be proven to be true, but are not irrational, have not abandoned reason in doing so. The point I'm going to make, therefore, is that actually we find ourselves in similar positions, whether we're scientists or whether we're religious believers. A good example from science would be the debate about whether there's simply one universe or whether there's this thing called a multiverse, a kind of bubble of universes. And many of you will know this debate. And the key point is simply that the observational evidence is there. The question is, how do you interpret it? And the multiverse, the universe, are two different ways of reading that same evidence. There's no question of the evidence forcing you to one conclusion. It's open. And you've got to try and figure out where you stand. And having sat in on some of these discussions, you know, I can say with complete integrity that I hear some of my scientific colleagues at Oxford saying, we believe this is the best way of looking at things, and others taking the opposite position, we believe this is the best way of looking at things. But listen very carefully. They all know the way things are. So it's none of this nonsense, you're irrational thinking that. It's this gracious, informed realization that reality is complicated. 
and therefore slick, simple answers very often are just not right. And so this recognition that we have to learn to live with this tension between different ways of thinking because the evidence itself is not absolutely ambiguous. Looking back on my own intellectual career, I think I would now say that in effect um, I was someone who believed that there was no God, in brackets, thinking I could prove it, close brackets, who became a Christian, now believing there is a God, in brackets, but realizing I can't prove that, and then in a much longer bracket, but then looking back at my time as an atheist, I realized I couldn't prove that either. So in effect, it's a question of atheism and Christianity, other faiths, in effect being faith, being belief systems, and just recognizing that and moving on from this very unhelpful attempt to say there's faith and there's fact. I mean, that's a very 18th century position, and we have rather moved on from that. Things are much more complicated simply because, in effect, facts very often rest on theoretical reflections on observational entities. So I want to give plenty of time for discussion, so let me begin to wrap things up. How do we think about the relationship of science and faith? Well, the answer is there are many ways we could do this, and I've tried to map out a few, but there are many other things that need to be said. But for me, one of the things that really I find very attractive and powerful about uh, Christianity is what C.S. Lewis identified in his own life as a thing that drew him to faith, away from atheism back in the late 1920s. And it is a sense that Christianity offers you this persuasive, attractive, and intelligible way of looking at the world. And Lewis summarized this in a, a quotation which you'll find at the end of a lecture he gave at Oxford during the Second World War. And this is a quotation that he, he ends that lecture with. I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. And the point I think he's making there is that the capacity of a system to make sense of things is indicative of its truthfulness or its reliability. I, I would endorse that. I endorse it humbly. I'm not being arrogant about this, but it does seem to me to be something that's really very important. Now, here's the big point. Lewis was very, very clear that that big picture could include science, could help us make sense of science and its limits, without in any way colonizing science as a kind of Christian activity. So for me, that is quite an important point to make. As I'm here at St. Paul's, I ought to say that John Dunn, who was Dean of St. Paul's in the old St. Paul's before the Great Fire of London, actually says something very, very similar in his sermons, and those are well worth looking at um, for that reason. So let me bring this lecture to an end and that leaves plenty of time for discussion, and by trying to say, if, if we are talking about maybe science and religion enriching each other, and obviously I know many of you will say, well, we're not sure that can be done, but just run with me for a few moments. How might that actually happen? In other words, I've talked about something in a very abstract way, this idea of enrichment. Could I try and provide you with some sort of illustration or application to give you a sense of how that might work out. So I'm going to give you one or two just to show how this might work out. And these are simply ones I find helpful or representative, and I'm sure there are many others that could be given as well. One of them is Einstein's theory of relativity. And many of you will know about this. It's all about world lines. It's about point x1, z1, t1, and then moving on to uh, x2, z2, t2, and so on. And basically, Einstein's point is that, in effect, the physical description of the universe is set out in terms of what we sometimes call these world lines. Here's the point. In uh, just about a year before he died himself, one of um, Einstein's closest friends at Zurich, Michel Besso, died. And uh, Einstein wrote a very interesting letter of condolence to Besso's family. In effect, saying, look, for us believing physicists, that's his phrase, um, we all know that past, present, and future just, you know, they're all the same. There's no difference between them. That, that actually, the sense that the present is really important is kind of illusion that we hold on to. And I often wonder what Besso's family made in response to that letter of condolence. 
uh, because it, it kind of it didn't really seem to engage the fact that Besser had actually died. Uh, and that, yes, it, it's right. Look, look, there's the past, there's the present, there's the future. We're not there in the past, we're here in the present, we're not there in the future. And actually, it's quite important to us that we live in this present moment and think of that as being significant. And Rudolf Carnap, uh, um, a very famous Viennese um, philosopher who happened to be in Princeton around the time that Einstein was there, said that as, as Einstein reflected on this, he began to realize that for human beings, questions of identity, the present moment, the fact that we exist in this bit of history, but not that bit of history, is actually really important. And the point that Norat was making simply was that uh, um, this didn't seem to fit into Einstein's way of thinking. And he reports Einstein as, in effect, saying that he seemed to realize there was something beyond physics that was necessary if we were to give people something meaningful by which they can live. Well, that's quite interesting, because the key point is that Einstein is not saying, I give up on relativity. There's much more, maybe we need something more than that to deal with who human beings are and what is they're looking for. But here's another one. This is much simpler. This is looking at the night sky. I'm sure many of you have done this. Um, I opened the book, Inventing the Universe, by just talking about um, an experience I had back in the 1970s when I and a friend decided we would um, go around Iran. And we did that. And, and to do it, you had to go by bus in the middle of the night because it was so hot during the day. And we went across these vast deserts on the way from one city to another. And in one of these cases, the bus broke down in the middle of a desert, in the middle of the night. And all the passengers got off and waited for the bus to be fixed, but it was a vast desert. It was solemn, it was still, there was a pitch black sky above us and the stars were blazing down with an intensity I've never seen before. I mean, the air pollution here, there was none in the Iranian desert. And I was overwhelmed by the sense of amazement at this um, universe around us. I kind of way struggled to take it in, but it was very much there. And I suppose the question that that raises for many of us is this. How do we begin to observe this remarkable universe without simply reducing it to the level of theoretical functions. In other words, how can we understand how the universe works without losing that sense of amazement and awe and wonder at the beauty of the universe? And that's why I think we need to have systems at our disposal, intellectual frameworks, which help us say we can look at this wonderful universe and try and make sense of it, while at the same time allowing us to take delight in it in a sense, almost saying it is so big we cannot take it in, and that makes us wonder. But at the same time, we're very grateful. We seem to be able to make so much sense of it. But you see, lying behind it, there is this deeper question. Not simply the response of wonder and amazement, but this deeper question of what does it mean? And that really is the point I'm going to end on. This need for meaning, which I flagged up earlier in this lecture. The psychologists tell us it's human to seek for meaning. So we look at the night sky, what does it mean? It might just mean that we are hopelessly insignificant, that in effect the vastness of the universe overwhelms us, we don't matter to anyone, we're here for a while, gone, and that is it. And some of you may know a very interesting book by an American cell biologist. The book is entitled The Sacred Depths of the Universe. It's a very interesting book. And in this book, um, one of the major themes is simply the sense of the intellectual pressure that, that begins to emerge as you recognize the universe is going to end, that in effect uh, we seem to be hopelessly insignificant, and that in effect caused the writer of that book simply to close these questions down. The universe is so big, we are so small, we are insignificant in comparison. You might find that very same idea expressed in that very interesting Persian work, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. That inverted bowl we call the sky, we're under crawling, cooked we live and die, lift not your hands to it for help, for it rolls impotently on as thou and I. That's that sort of idea.
Christianity, I speak of Christianity because it's the faith I know best and, and to which I, I adhere, gives you a different way of looking at that. It says, yes, the universe is vast, but you nonetheless matter. And you might think of Psalm 8, which looks at the immensity of the universe and then makes the point that actually each of us still matter to that God who made them. And in effect, articulates almost like a theological framework in which the doctrine of creation becomes, in effect, a means of sustaining hope, identity, and meaning in the face of this vastness of the universe. So in this lecture, I've kicked around a lot of ideas. I've kicked them about very, very briefly. It's simply to give you an idea of some of the questions that the relation of science of faith might raise and some of the answers that might be given. And clearly, in the book itself, I talk about a lot of other issues in more detail. And I have just published another book called The Great Mystery, The Great Mystery, published again by Hodder, which focuses on this question of why is it as human beings, we ask questions about meaning and where do those thing, thing, uh, thoughts take us. So that basically is a very brief synopsis of a fascinating field. I'm not going to stand back and let you take the floor for the next uh, 20, 25 minutes. I'm very happy to let you direct the conversation in whatever way you like and I will do the best I can to answer your questions. So, who would like to begin our conversations? If you'd just like to raise your hand, I will try and pick you up and we'll see where the conversations go. Uh, I'm looking for a question, and there's a question here. Yes, please. You said that um, there are no definitions of science or religion. It seems to me that that's avoiding the issue, because surely there has to be debate about it. And if you decide on Well, I think that if you look at the literature, there's, there's a very significant debate about what is science, what is pseudoscience, what lies outside it. And for me, this, I actually share your view to some extent, this isn't a very important question, but some think it's very important. I think what, what you can do is say that there is a generalized scientific method which finds application in different ways in different fields. I think that's quite an important point um, to begin with. But actually, it is very, very difficult to know where to draw boundaries and what, in effect, counts as science and what does not. And the, the question is made much more difficult by the English language, which uses the word science to mean what other languages mean by simply intellectual disciplines in general. So that there's a real issue there. I mentioned Peter Harrison's work. And Peter Harrison's work, uh, The Territories of Science and Religion, is a historical survey of what the word science has meant in literature, really over the last thousand years, and making the point it shifts meaning. It shifts in response to changing practice, it shifts in, change, in response to changing social debates, and shifts in response to cultural contexts. And he draws a rather dispiriting conclusion that actually it's very, very difficult to give any meaningful answer to the question, what is science? That doesn't stop people from saying, well, surely it's this. I think that's an entirely reasonable response. I mean, you could, I think, quite easily give an answer in terms of utility, which I think is, is possibly your approach. But I think some people do take the following line of argument. Science is what tells us what is right. Therefore, we privilege science in social discourse and so on. So actually, in that sense, for those people, it is actually quite significant. For me, science illuminates part of the picture, but only part and we need to bring in other disciplines as well. If you like, it's going back to C.P. Snow and that very famous lecture of 50 plus years ago. And it just seems to me that we need to find some way of holding these together. Because there's a real danger that scientists and, and, and humanities people just don't talk to each other. And I think there's a real conversation to be had there. Thank you, let's keep going. You talked about, um, uh, in your examples about multi-universe, mm. between multi-universe and, and a single universe, and about the graciousness of both sides, and could that be um, duplicated with Christianity and with other religions, as well as science and Christianity and other religions, but, but all the major faiths looking at each other in that way? Well, I do hope so. I mean, I mean, my own view is that you can say, I think I'm right, and I think I have good reason thinking I'm right, but A, this doesn't allow me to be arrogant and to, in effect, dismiss others. And B, in my view, the supreme characteristic of somebody who is secure in their beliefs is their willingness to listen to others. 
Because in effect, that is how, if you are a searcher for truth, rather than a searcher for dogma of some sort, you know, in the end, your conversations with other people will help you either say, I think I'm still right because I can respond to that, or in effect, I may need to do some more thinking. And those conversations are what helps you find truth. I have to say, I dislike intensely dogmatism, whether it is atheist or scientific or religious, precisely because it tries to shut those conversations down. It tries to imply it's almost academically irrespectable and irresponsible to have those kind of conversations. I think we really need to have those conversations, and I've tried to suggest that we need to be respectful and humble about them, but I do want to emphasize that it doesn't mean you give up on what you believe to be truth. It means that you feel, well, if I really have found the truth, then I ought to be able to respond gracefully to this. And if I can't, maybe I haven't found the truth. For me, the more aggressive somebody is, it's very often a smokescreen for intellectual insecurity. So that's a very important point to bear in mind, I think. Good question, thank you. Let's keep going. Over in the corner, please. Good afternoon. I wonder um, how you might respond to a humanist worldview of why we create the meaning. Well, I, I think I would need to ask you what you mean by the word humanist, because I mean, I'm a Christian humanist. I have friends who are Islamic humanists, I have friends from Jewish humanists. I mean, do you mean a secular humanist? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would say that um, this is a very important conversation. Let's have it. And, and let, let's begin by saying, you know, we need all perspectives to be in the conversation because, you know, this, this is how civilized human beings proceed, if I put it like that. My own view is that um, secular humanism, um, in effect, does need to take this question of why it is that human beings seek meaning much more seriously than they've done. And I think that, um, I mean, I, I don't want, I mean, I mean, there are atheists in this room. I'm delighted you're here. I do not judge you by Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. I want to make that absolutely clear. I mean, that, that is just not representative of an intellectual respect for atheism. And one of the reasons is that he, in effect, just closes this question down. It's a very important question. I think we need to really take it very, very seriously. For me, the really interesting question that emerges from this, and that's one where I think I would very much like to hear the secular humanist answer given clearly, because I think it's very important, is what bigger picture can we give that leads us to seek meaning in the first place? If it's someone like C.S. Lewis uh, or, or John Donne, you know, I mean, basically the answer is all to do with being made in God's image, which in effect gives us a homing instinct for God, that kind of thing. So in effect, there's a kind of, it, it fits in very neatly into this uh, way of thinking. I, I, I have read certain secular humorous writers, and I have to say I'm not, I, I'm looking for something more than that. And if, if that conversation gives me more than that, I would personally be delighted with it. Again, these conversations really matter. Thank you. Uh, over here, please, sir, and then we'll go forward. Back to you, sir. Yes, please. I think my question follows on that because um, I tend to think you did raise the question what might be the meaning of life. Well, I certainly did, yes, yes. You didn't answer it by saying, well, <laughs> we're all intended to exist by God. I take it you believe that to be the case. So I tend to believe that um, we're the result of evolution and we have conscious experiences can be pleasant or unpleasant, and we should endeavour to diminish the unpleasant ones and maximise the pleasant ones. Yeah. But my question really is, um, how do you conceive the universe, assuming it was planned to exist by God 14 or so billion years ago, so that we are here now? Do you conceive that at the moment of the initial creation, God knew exactly what was going to happen because he knew and could work out every last detail to an infinite number of decimal places which he would need to do to get us here now, which uh, is a possible uh, thing um, if determinism is true in physics. But that also knocks away a lot of religious notions about the judgment of God and everything to do with judging people all their actions would have been uh, determined by the initial big bang. Or do you, final point, do you think that quantum theory is true? There's indeterminism, which means that every moment an atom could go this way or that way, and not even God could work out which way it could go because it's arbitrary. 
in which case he couldn't be certain, however carefully he started it, that we would be here now. Well, let's begin with that third point. I mean, uh, as you know, there are multiple ways of understanding quantum theory. They're all empirically equivalent. And certainly what you've given us is a slightly popularized account of the Copenhagen way of reading it. But then you see you might also think of David Boom's approach, or you might think of others as well, where actually indeterminism is not intrinsic to the way the universe is. It's an aspect of that particular way of reading quantum theory. And you have to explain why you chose that way of reading quantum theory rather than a different one, because they do have very different metaphysical implications. I think for me, one of the most important things that for a Christian way of thinking is that God, in effect, creates human beings with the capacity for for change, for freedom, for making decisions. And that, I think, does raise questions about um, determinist reading of things. I, mean, I am puzzled, for example, by Sam Harris's book on free will, which um, seems to me to, in effect, basically rule the idea out. It just seems to me to be a, a very worrying account of what human beings are. Because you rightly pointed out the importance of meaning. And I, I didn't really get, give my account of what I think by meaning, but it's along the lines you think. Um, but the point I was trying to make is that the actual, the fact that we seek for meaning is really important. And you can guess what my approach to meaning is. But I think that there's something really very important to add to this, and, and, and it's this, that um, we, we talk very loosely about God creating the universe. Uh, I think what we need to say is actually that we tend to, in effect, almost think of there being a timeline. And at T1, along that timeline, God brings the universe into being. And, and kind of the, the real difficulty is that time is itself part of that created order. So in effect, we are talking about the establishment of time and matter at the same time, which raises some very interesting questions. So for me, the, there is no need to propose a radical determinism. I think that that is one way of reading a quantum uh, approach to, to, to our universe. But I think that there are many other things which I think need to brought into that picture as well. Thank you. Uh, was it uh, yes. towards the back? Yes, please, sir. Uh, thank you. You are in a unique position being a brilliant scientist and an erudite theologian. Now, Thomas had some doubt about resurrection, and he, he has to see the mark before believing. Christ said, well, do you believe because you've seen the mark? And Christ's answer was, blessed are those who have not seen the mark, but yet believe. What is more important for us as Christians? Is it to have some doubts about the existence of God and so on, or to continue with our faith in believing in the existence of God? Thank you. I think that's a very good question, and it's going to require a longer answer than I can give. But let me, let me sketch the beginnings of an answer. Number one, um, it's not just Christians who have doubts. Any thinking person will have doubts about their worldview precisely because there's always a point of conflict between the worldview and the universe. The difficulty is that um, you, you, you find that there is always intellectual tension between any, if I can put like this big picture, any meta-narrative, precisely because it is so, so embracing and the complexities of our universe. So, you know, I mean, I, mean, um, I have atheist friends who will say, well, we are atheists, but you know, we, we are aware it's not, it, there are some, there are some little problems, you know, they're, they're quite clear about that. So I want to say that actually, you raised the question specifically about Christianity, but it's a broader question of how we coexist with doubt. I read Bertrand Russell many years ago, and, and Russell was, I, I, ultimately, I think, not so as an atheist, he's more just uh, someone who realized that it's very, very difficult to answer questions and pragmatically chosen to be an atheist. But if you read his book, The Principles of Western Philosophy, on Page seven of the introduction, there's a wonderful line, which I kind of still carry around with me, which is that the chief task of philosophy is to enable us to cope with uncertainty without being paralyzed by indecision. I know it's a, it's a wonderful line saying, look, this is the way things are, get used to it. Uh, but that doesn't need to paralyze us. Now, the example you've given from John's Gospel is very, very powerful. And, and there are two things I think I would say in response to that. One is to say that doubt is just part of the life of faith. Certainly true of the Christian faith, and actually I have to say any faith where the believer actually thinks about things will find that the same thing is true there. And maybe in the case of John's Gospel, maybe there's also this thought that this, this episode, 
is actually intended to console those who have these same doubts later and just say, look, um, these have been anticipated. You're in good company. That might set context for the kind of questions you're thinking. A lot more needs to be said, but thank you very much. Yes, please, and then over here. I think that might be all we can fit in, but please, yes? How would you define meaning, or what does meaning mean? How would I define meaning? That is really interesting. And the reason it's really interesting is because um, there's a very interesting series of seminars at Oxford going on right now about exactly this question. Um, how, what does meaning mean? And, and it's a really difficult question. Um, I, uh, there are a whole series of um, philosophers who, in effect, talk about philosophy disengaging with this question because it's so difficult to answer. And um, I think one of the things you notice is that people find it much easier to say, let us figure out what people find meaningful, which is a sort of descriptive or empirical kind of things. Whereas the question of meaning actually is almost something, something deep in that. This is, there is something there which perhaps is to be discovered or perhaps you, know, you, you come across, and that tells you what things really are all about. Or is it the word meaning has a normative sense? And so I think that there's a real issue there. For me, the, the big problem is this. Science is extremely good at dealing with things that can be empirically observed. But you can't read off meaning from the world. In fact, it's about an interpretation of what's going on in the world. And so for that me, that's to, for me, that's saying this is not something we can resolve empirically. We can't, in fact, do an experiment to say, you know, this means that, this means this. You know, in effect, we're, we're left with this uncertainty. And yet, on the other hand, there is this very strong body of scientific evidence which says, in effect, to be human is to quest for meaning. I think you've read uh, a book by Jeanette Winterson. It's called, uh, it's a lovely title, it came out three years ago, Why Be Happy When You Can Be Normal? Isn't that a wonderful title? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and in it, she says, uh, the human beings don't just eat, hunt, reproduce, they search for meaning. We are meaning-seeking animals. I think he's absolutely right. That's what the literature is saying. But that does not tell us what the answer is. And that, that for me, is, is, is why things are so complicated. You know, all literature is saying it is human to quest for meaning. And yet, very often, we then say, that's great. What is the answer to that question? Well, you see, that, that's where the interesting bit really starts. So what I'm saying to you is, is that I think that, that because it's so important, we do need to ensure we can deal with that. Because as again, you will know, there's quite a large body of literature saying if you feel you have found meaning, you can cope with doubt and distress. Um, Nietzsche's book, um, the German title is Goods and Demer, Twilight of the Idols. One of his <coughs> philosophical aphorisms is, you can cope with any how if you have a why. You see what he's getting at? He's saying, but he doesn't, that does not mean he can tell us what meaning is. It's this. He can say it's really important, and, and we can all agree on that. So I'm afraid I'm, I'm, I, I can tell you what I think, and I can tell you why I thought it. But I, I've, I've not come here to kind of really dump my views on you. I'm saying that really there's such a big question, there's more discussion. And in this book I mentioned The Great Mystery. I'm, I'm opening up precisely that question with the literature and just saying, let's look at some of the answers given and see where they take us. So thank you for raising that very good question. And over here, we have what's going to be our last question today, I'm afraid. Yes, please. Um, you touched on the Einstein decision about past, present, future. Yes. And there was a suggestion that we find more significance for ourselves in living in the mm. present. But did, it, what do you think about whether we find more meaning perhaps in trying to grapple with the understanding of God as outside time and that is Well, that, that, again, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I mean if God um, created the universe, there's a sense in which God is outside time, because that's what creation makes happen. And yet, certainly, when I was thinking about these things back when I was 18, you know, one of my big issues was, well, that, you know, if there is a God, then it makes no difference to life at all, because God's outside of the space-time um, you know, whole thing. What, what difference does that make? And then I discovered this Christian idea of incarnation. And actually, that's a game changer, because that is very much about God outside time, coming into time, inhabiting the specifics of space and time, and therefore becoming available and accessible to people in time. And if that's right, it, it really is a game changer. 
So that, that to me was really very important. But I think your question you know, raises lots of other issues as well. And I think that really as, as, as I wrap this lecture up, I think that one of the things to say is that I think that Christian churches are very often quite good at saying this is what Christians think. I, I don't think they're very good at saying here's, here's why we think these things. But for me, the, the really important thing is actually not so much that, but if this is true, what difference does it make? See what I'm saying? And so for me, that, that really is a question of trying to unpack the, the implications of this way of thinking for the way we think, the way we live. And that seems to me just something that is still a work in progress if I could begin. We've had some wonderful questions. Uh, they would be much better than the answers I gave, I'm afraid. But I hope that they show to you that there's these very rich questions, that this is a really interesting topic. Uh, and I've just given you what I think about. There, there's a lot more to think about, and I very much hope that in some way I've tried to open this up for wider discussion. Thank you so much indeed.